Good evening, everybody. Um, it's so nice to see such a good crowd here for our pre-concert conversation. My name is David Plyler. I'm with the Music Division. And it is uh, kind of a, a, an amazing evening that we have in store for you tonight. Um, and I'm here with three guests from the ensemble who will be performing. Um, I have Graham Steele Johnson, who is uh, kind of the instigator behind this project, as we'll find out. So it's his fault. Um, <laughs> We have David Schiffen, a uh, clarinetist. Uh, Graham is also a clarinetist. And then we also have uh, Bridget Kibbe, our harpist, um, who will have a lot to say. There's some amazing um, harp components to tonight's program. So uh, please join me in welcoming them. <laughs> so um, just a little bit of background on this. We uh, were approached about this, I believe is what happened, that you sent us a note about it. And we don't, we don't usually um, you know, just, just uh, program in this way where we uh, take outside solicitations, but, um, <laughs> you, know, you know, unless the, um, you know, but it was, th this was a, um, a very promising one because it was a, uh, um, Graham sent us a, a description of his project that involved a manuscript that we actually have on display in the Coolidge foyer next door, which you can check out in a little bit. Um, but it kind of, uh, it, it grew out of uh, an octet that we had in our collection that had not been played in 120 some odd years. <laughs> and so um, we're a big fan of trying to bring life back to pieces in our collection, especially when uh, the odds are good that the piece is worth hearing. Um, which they were in this case, in the case of Charles Leffler. Um, but first, um, w the, our, our program is going to start with um, uh, Debbie C., a transcription that Graham did. And uh, this kind of is what helped to lead, I think, to your um, kind of discovery of the Leffler in our collections. So I wonder if you could just say a, a little bit about your um, work as an arranger with the Debbie C., and uh, what prompted that, and so forth. Sure. The Debussy, this is um, his prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, one of his most beloved works for a very large orchestra. Um, this is an arrangement I wrote in 2018, um, kind of taking some of the primary voices from that orchestral piece. Uh, it's, it's got a very famous flute solo um, throughout the piece big harp moments, and so I, I took kind of the most important voices from the orchestral version and distilled it into um, an octet inspired by a piece, uh, the instrumentation of a piece by um, Debussy's impressionist contemporary, Maurice Ravel. Uh, he wrote a septet called Introduction and Allegro for flute, clarinet, string quartet, and harp. And um, so I took those forces and added a bass to it to give it some of that orchestral kind of depth. Um, and the other thing about Debussy's score is it was inspired by a poem of the same title, The Afternoon of a Fawn, by Stéphane Mallarmé. And that poem is told from the perspective of a single narrator, a fawn, um, as he kind of recounts these, this sort of dizzying array of experiences at least he thinks they're experiences. He's not really sure. They could be just fantasy. And so the poem is all sort of very interior. And so in rearranging this kind of vast orchestral score for a more intimate um, chamber cast, I was trying to sort of reconnect uh, Debussy's music with the intimacy of the poetry that inspired it. And Bridget, uh, you're, you're playing in this piece. Naturally, the harp part, if you want <laughs> to surprise, just, just to, you know, not to surprise you on everything here. Um, what is your, um, have you played the, the piece in an orchestral setting as well? And what's, what's your uh, kind of response to this chamber setting? What's, what's different about it or what's the same? I think what's so exciting about what Graham has done is he's taken a lot of us who are mainly in a chamber music or solo world and we get to play these orchestra masterworks that we don't often get to play, in a sense. Um, I have played La Primidi, um like 20 years ago in orchestra, but it's something that I geek out about, look at the score, listen to, love it. And it's really exciting to take, you know, some 
very harpy roles in the piece like you would expect, but also maybe cover that horn moment in the middle of the harp, which is my favorite part of the range of the instrument that kind of sings and connects with these tendons and sinews within the strings. And so I think it's been fun to get to know Graham better and his choices and the way he's orchestrated the instruments to support one another to really cover a massive color palette with eight of us, right? So it's, it's really an amazing feat. I mean, Schoenberg's arrangement has keyboard, shalust, it's a larger ensemble. And, so. and no harp. Wait a minute. Schoenberg, more or less. I didn't, why did I bring that up exactly? I've been involved in performances of, of Schoenberg's arrangement where um, Nancy Allen, your colleague harpist, um, formed a part based on the keyboard. I, I, and I'm sure that Schoenberg did not have the availability of a harp when he did that arrangement for the Society of Private Musical Performances in Vienna. The whole idea was, to, was accessibility for large larger works and lesser known and lesser heard works for, for a, a very um, interested subscription audience in Vienna. So he considered um, Debussy a contemporary composer and he arranged it for what he had. And, and he was very fond of filling in with a harmonium for whatever <laughs> voices the instruments didn't, a little organ with foot pumps <laughs> that, you, that pop up a lot in um, chamber arrangements of, of Schoenberg. But it is kind of a shame to hear that piece without the harp. Yeah, so for me, the, the harp so is you, second you only to You brought it full, full stop to, right. <laughs> to that color. So um, you know, after, you've, uh, after you had uh, done this arrangement in 2018, I think you said, um, what was it that led you to kind of start to, to look into the, the notion of an oct another octet with similar orchestration like the Leffler. And how did you, can you just tell us that story? I think it's a good one. Sure. Um, well, I had a lot of time on my hands <laughs> because this was April 2020. All of my own concerts had been canceled. So I was spending that time writing program notes for various festivals around the country that had yet to pull the plug. And um, one of my assignments for, for one of those festivals uh, was to write about Leffler's two rhapsodies for oboe, viola, and piano, probably his best known work today. So I was just doing some background reading on him uh, and came across a list of works, just a kind of catalog of everything uh, he had written. And I saw in that list a mention of an octet, nothing about it other than the instrumentation. Uh, two clarinets, harp, string quartet, and bass. My Debussy arrangement is flute, clarinet, harp, string quartet, and bass, so almost identical. Um, and in my research, I had learned that Debussy, that, that Leffler had a, this sort of um, a heavy case of Francophilia. He wrote a lot like Debussy. He actually pretended he was French upon moving to the United States and has appeared to Americans as French, has since uh, been analyzed as a French composer, and still today I'll see program notes that open French composer Charles Martin Leffler. In fact, he was German, so this was a complete lie. <laughs> but given all of that, um, his French fascination and the similarity of this octet instrumentation to my octet arrangement, I th my first thought was, ooh, this could be a nice companion piece to my Debussy arrangement. So I started looking for a recording, couldn't find anything, looking for sheet music, couldn't find anything. And that's when I began to think I might be onto something. Um, so then I, was, I started checking libraries that I know have robust um, musical manuscript collections, such as uh, the Yale Library, Juilliard's Library, the Performing Arts Library at Lincoln Center, the Morgan Library, and uh, it was upon checking the Library of Congress that I saw it listed um, in their archives. Again, though, this was April 2020, so the library, too, was shuttered due to the pandemic. And so I, all I knew was they had it, <laughs> and it was listed as not published. 
And so I was like, ooh, okay. But I had no idea how long the piece was, um, what, what kind of state the manuscript was in, would it even be legible? Uh, certainly no idea what it sounded like. And I was sort of sitting on this find for several months until January 2021, when the library finally let their own employees back in, still not the public. Um, and that's when someone was able to scan it to me. And it was uh, this 75 page manuscript arrived in my inbox. So it's, it's great to be doing it here. And it's really great to be doing it alongside my WC arrangement, which kind of in a circuitous way led me to the piece. Right, well, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think the, the other thing that, um, that Graham didn't mention is the, that when you first see a new manuscript, you don't really know if it's a stinker or not. You know, and, so <laughs> and, so, and so you've had some time to spend with it and take a look at it. And um, I'm pleased to say that in my opinion, this is an excellent piece that is really uh, quite something. I think you're gonna be um, in disbelief that this is not a known uh, quantity. Um, I sh should mention that we, um, Mrs. Coolidge, uh, who you know, we're coming up on our hundredth anniversary of our concert series and the, and the construction of the Coolidge Auditorium next door. She was friends with uh, with Leffler, and in fact, his music was featured in the, uh, the first uh, cycle of three concerts that at here you know in in uh, in 1925. So um, it's a it's quite something to uh, kind of see it come full, full circle. I wish that it had stayed in the repertoire a bit longer, but um, but th this is something we can talk about. Bridget, you? Well, I was excited to learn today that Luffler was actually in the Boston Symphony, right, as associate concertmaster. So he was sitting in the orchestra playing. And I feel like this piece is such a display of different s orchestral styles. Like you can tell he was taking in Brahms, Hungarian rhapsodies. And um, there are parts of the piece that to me sound like Tchaikovsky, ballet overtures. I, I think it's, it's really fun the way he pits the winds and sometimes the harp with the strings and these sectionalized feelings that are really unique. So it, I, I feel like he has so many worlds in this piece that you've been able to set so beautifully. Yeah, and along those lines, I think his, his treatment of this mixed timbre ensemble wind strings and harp is really interesting and, and unique. Um, there are a lot of examples of large chamber music commingling winds and strings, um, Schubert being one of, the Schubert Octet uh, being one of those sort of archetypal works. And usually the way composers handle that kind of ensemble is you have sort of like a miniature string orchestra, so like a string quartet or quintet with a bass, and then a couple wind solo voices. Uh, so in, in the Schubert, you have clarinet, bassoon, and horn as your wind soloists. Um, Leffler's octet similarly has a mini string orchestra, five string instruments. But it's interesting that the two ostensibly wind soloists are the same instrument, um, which for me makes it kind of less like solo voices and more like another orchestral section, like a clarinet section. Um, and then it, it sort of, I don't know if you feel this way, creates this kind of stereophonic balance across the group, a pair of clarinets opposite a pair of violins. But I, I, as you'll hear, the, the first clarinet part that Graham is playing is also a major solo role. I mean, you really... Well, and yours too. Uh, well, the second clarinet comes in and out, but, but um, and, and certainly fills out the color of the ensemble to have the pair and, and play in harmony and, and to really um, fill out the sonority. But I think that the protagonists are huh. sometimes, occasionally, this is a clarinet, certainly the viola and the cello, and the first violin and the, and the mm -hmm. first clarinet in, in, in sometimes in, in response to one another. And then filling out the whole thing with incredible color is, is the harp, mm -hmm. which plays, oh, I'm sorry, which plays so many different roles in the ensemble, but then asserts itself very close to the end as the true soloist with this virtuoso cadenza. What's, what was that like for you when you looked for <laughs> through this? It's Yes, it was a surprise because I came in last minute to read uh, a couple years ago and a year ago, gosh, 
and um, we were playing it through, and I was I was just delighted because I felt like I was a part of an orchestra, which is so rare, that feeling of, of a great orchestra. Then we got to the end, there's a great um, Hungarian dance that takes place, and the harp takes over, and a kind of Tsiganish arpeggiations that leads us into the final presto. Um, so fun to play. I like to drive the bus sometimes with rhythm, so I finally get to do that, which is really fun. You know, the, the um, just from an outsider's viewpoint, the harp is, is, is one of the best. Uh, it, it's so cleverly orchestrated throughout the entire thing. And the, and the fact that um, all of your harmonics are audible and, uh, and these, are, these are things that are oftentimes softer in the, in a, if it's not carefully orchestrated so that one can hear them. And they're, um, but melded with the other instruments in a very interesting way. And that maybe, uh, since you just mentioned that cadenza, I think this would be a, a good, we, uh, Graham and I had the opportunity to speak this morning um, at length about uh, some of these manuscript issues, but I think that this is one that's worth um, maybe uh, mentioning as an example of this to this audience, which is that um, it wasn't originally going to be a harp cadenza, at least it didn't seem like it was going to be. But maybe you can say a bit more about that, Graham. Yeah, I knew um, Bridget would be crushed if I kept the original <laughs> text in. <laughs> Yeah, w well, one thing about Leffler's compositional process was he was kind of, um, he he was extremely obsessive. He revised kind of um, insatiably and actually withheld most of his music from publication. It was sort of like he could never quite get it ready. And he, though he professed a kind of stoicism to critical opinion, he was actually very sensitive to how his music was received. So. Um, in the end, he would rather his music be unheard than unappreciated. And so the, Lef the, the octet score is no different. It, it's mosaicked with um, revisions and heavy deletions. Um, in many cases, he would compose entire pages, plural, of music, and then just draw a line through it, um, which really complicated the restoration process for me. Um, in some cases, he would paste new music over the old music, so the original text was no longer legible. Um, that's simple enough, but when it's just a single line drawn through and you can still read the original text, it's kind of like, is it more authentic to go with the original concept of the work or the latest version of it? And so this harp cadenza is an interesting, another one of these dramatic transformations. Um, it originally was not a cadenza at all. It had the harp playing, yes, but with it was busy with lots of other activity, um, all sorts of different rhythmic figures and instruments entering in pairs and then individually and then kind of a snowballing um, 16th notes leading into the final presto. And um, and then ultimately he, r he scrawled in, in very large script uh, over this passage in the score in German, harp alone. Um, so he changed his mind. And the final um, form of that passage is, yeah, is just a harp, really dramatic flourish with a barely audible um, <laughs> bass drone underneath, still leading to that um, final presto. And so I, w I wonder, I mean, we can't say why he made a change like that. But looking at the original score, I, I wonder if he just deemed it too busy and thought a starker texture would be more dramatic for this kind of climactic moment of the piece. It, it, almost, it almost sounded to me uh, like it, it might have been meant for or imitating uh, the cimbalum, uh, the end of a, at a, of a, a Roma. <laughs> Um, Zingare's totally, uh, a, and uh, yeah. it, it it serves that 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 function that as in so many of that you know, does works he, of he does Kodai or or Janicek. does he label it Zingare's in somewhere in the score? Also? Yeah, the the tempo of the allegro section of the last movement is allegro alla Zingara, which is also an interesting marking. Zingaro would be. Uh, the male form and sort of the standard form, or you often see like, um, you know, Rondo a la Zingareze, um, but Zingara, specifically a woman, 
um, is is kind of an interesting specification. And how is it um, labeled? If you, if you know, um, in, in Brahms G minor piano quartet. Yeah, I think that's where, where the piano takes it. Alla Alla Zinga Reze. So there you go. <laughs> but was but this is interesting. So Loeffler's earliest um, musical memories, he was born in Berlin um, and then lived kind of an itinerant childhood throughout Eastern Europe. Uh, it, the first stop on that tour was um, in the Hungarian countryside. And his earliest musical memories are of Hungarian folk bands passing through town and playing these instruments that we're talking about now. You know, one other comment on this harp cadenza is that it, it reminds me a bit of like what happens with Tchaikovsky ballet, um, the, where, where it just becomes uh, idiomatic for the harpist to kind of create a performance practice with it, which is essentially what you're doing. You could do something wild tonight, and nobody <laughs> would, that could be like that would be the <laughs> that would be like what the what it is, you know. <laughs> But there's something about it that, that does kind of feel like there's a certain sense of ab abandonment. And I wonder if he had, had that sense with his players as he was going through maybe this. This was one of the other things that we were talking about that would be interesting to hear, hear you speak more about is that um, you, in addition to the manuscript score that we have at the library, we also have manuscript parts. And they are different um, in different places. And so <laughs> Graham had to make a lot of decisions, um, you know, using, you know, a lot of different clues, and so uh, you know, maybe you can speak to that a little bit. There's so much. There's a, it's a big topic, but <laughs> yeah, in in many cases, it was helpful to have um, two sources to reference to cross reference the score and the parts, um, and it, in many cases, that helped confirm certain uncertainties um, that that one source left. However, in many other cases, the sources disagreed and. I would have loved a third source <laughs> to break the tie. <laughs> but um, my approach <coughs> in reconciling these discrepancies generally was, especially like with Leffler's heavy revising um, impulse, um, there are certain cuts that exist in the manuscript score that are not in the parts, and there are certain cuts that are in the parts not in the score. And so, that says different things about when he might have arrived at those decisions, whether in the compositional process or in the rehearsal process. And the rehearsal process introduces all sorts of different variables, players' opinions um, and abilities and uh, practical considerations like length of the program. In fact, this piece premiered on a program sandwiched between about an hour's worth of string quartets. So pretty hefty program. This piece is 30 minutes long itself. Um, and we also know from, from a contemporary review in the Boston Evening Transcript that at least one critic was present at a rehearsal. And given what we know about Loeffler's sensitivity to criticism, the knowledge that there was at least one critic in the room um, really kind of throws into question the musical integrity of some of these dramatic incursions to his score, that maybe they weren't just um, intrinsically motivated musical decisions, but rather the result of outside pressure. So for that reason, I've um, r resisted the kind of reflex to just automatically adopt revisions as a more refined version of the composer's vision and have actually, you know, tried to question them where I can and, and dealt with them on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so in general, I've, I've prioritized um, adopting revision, like transferring revisions to my edition that are sanctioned by both the manuscript score and the parts. Um, but there are many that are more complicated than that. And so in those cases, I had to sort of appraise them individually and um, kind of take into account a whole host of other factors. Sure. And one thing I should mention about uh, Graham has created a critical edition of this that's still evolving. I think as you make it, make it makes a few more decisions. Uh, I, I don't think it's quite finalized, but you, in that edition, sometimes those uh, p passages are dealt with with OSEA, what they're called alternative OSEA passages, where 
the um, it gives a certain amount of agency to the uh, performer to be able to make some decisions about the things where where it's where it really is kind of a, a toss up as to what um, what one might choose to do. And so uh, he's given when when possible he's giving that uh, those ch types of choices to the performer. Yeah, that's right. I think one of the most Lefflerian if you could say that, things about the score is that it exists in multiple different versions. And so I've tried to sort of preserve some of that plurality of the music in my edition and transfer some of the interpretive agency to the performers rather than presume to assert one single definitive version of the piece. You might say that's a bit uh, on the far left flirt of the Sorry, I apologies all around. Um, you know, one uh, one other thing I think we should say about this that, that also is really important with respect to um, Bridget again is the uh, where this is in the where we talked earlier about Ravel and Debussy. This piece is from 1897, and so Ravel is what 1903 or five or something like that. But not premiered until 1907. And not okay, and then yeah, and then the Debussy is 1915, I think. So you have the the pieces that are known as the chamber music harp pieces, are post date this work by a number of years, and it's not they wouldn't have known this because it wasn't, um, um, you know. But that's just a food for thought. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a noteworthy precedent because those pieces are kind of. Right, Bridget held up as like the first major harp showcases in a chamber setting. Yeah, how does the writing compare with things like the sacred and profane dances of Debussy and the and the Ravel? I think that's an amazing question because I think he betrays his Germanic nature and the way he writes for the harp. It's a lot of arpeggiations um, versus Debussy, of course, like the shading that he uses in the chordal writing, I think the harp is really doing more arpeggiations through this piece to drive or to accompany. Um, but it is amazing to think about how he would have encountered the harp, the concert harp, at the same time that two piano makers in Paris were vying to um, create the new mechanism of the modern harp. And so Debussy was commissioned to write Debussy Dance um, by a, a piano maker, Playel, who had created, this is the new version of the harp. And then Ravel was commissioned by Erard, a piano maker. No, this is the new version of the harp. And those two pieces were performed to showcase what they thought would be the new version of the harp. What stuck was the Ravel Erard instrument to today. But it's, and now I have to go research. I had no idea that the Luffler predated those two pieces. Ten years. So what kind of a harp would it have been I, for? That's great. I think it would have been on the double action chromatic harp like you're going to see on stage this evening where the pedals manipulate the sharps and flats. But it's very diatonically written. You could essentially play the Luffler on a diatonic instrument versus the modern harp because you could, you could voice it such that it works with the keys. So to me, it kind of has more of a classical style to the way it's been written versus Ravel and Debussy to me are pushing the boundaries more on what the harp can do. And it's non-idiomatic. This is the new idiomatic nature. Excellent. No, that's, that's really something to think about. <laughs> no, harp is always one of those, it's, it's one of those instruments that's I think difficult for non-harpists to non-harpist composers to really wrap their heads around and get to know. So that's interesting that, um, and especially around that time when things were changing, um, you know, all these things to be considered. But I think tonight's harp writing is really kind of like the duck soup version where Charlie Chaplin went in. Oh my gosh, not Charlie Chaplin, Harpo Marx. <laughs> coffee um you know took the harp out of the middle of the piano and started playing it's it's almost like an upright piano in the Luffler writing versus in La Primidi you're going to be hearing those glissandi the colorations that are like oh that's the harp I think Luffler uses it almost in a keyboard type way but I love it I think it's so appropriate and I keep coming back to the um Chimbalum yes. thought because that's like a harp played with mallets so it's sort of a cross between the Well, excellent. Does anybody else have anything else to say about the Luffler? Well, why don't we... Oh, I have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Uh, Some Luffler. You can wait until you hear it. Don't decide now. But if you like it, uh, our world premiere recording is about to be released on CD on June 7th. But we brought bootleg copies with us. <laughs> which will be available for purchase uh, after the show. 
Excellent. Um. <laughs> With these artists that you see here, and uh, also including my Debussy arrangement, so if you like that, and also including uh, an extra little bonbon that you won't hear on stage tonight, so you will have to buy the CD to hear it, <laughs> featuring Bridget and me. Another little known Leffler piece, originally a song for voice and piano um, that we do on clarinet and harp, titled Tempre Oublié, which translates to forgotten sounds. Too good to resist. Can I just give a little quick love note about these two in the middle here with the Loeffler? This concert, it's my first experience playing in this concert hall, and everything sounds amazing. But I, I particularly have always loved Mr. Schifrin's sound. It's singular. It's incredible. Grew up listening to it. Um, Graham is someone I respect that's a new friend. And it, hearing them together in this hall with the soaring sound, it's really special. So I think the Loeffler is going to just showcase that so beautifully. So it's an honor and a treat to sit next to that and hear these two spinning clarinets kind of weaving together. And it's, it's really special. It's a special it's night. It's certainly a sonority that you do not hear very often. Uh, also, David was my teacher, for those who don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> if we sound good, that could be why. Well, maybe we could just say a few words about the Schubert. That's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's the lighter work on the program in terms of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this is we have we decided we're keeping with octets. We we're gonna we we're, we're gonna try for eight octets, but uh, we just <laughs> ran out of space in the program. But um, especially after the Schubert, <laughs> which is the uh, Schubert monster. counts for seven of That's them right. anyway. There you go. Yeah, it's got at least six of the movements, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, maybe, uh, yeah, let's say a bit about the experience with that. I think, David, I think you're the only one on this stage who's playing in that one. Interesting, yeah, I hadn't <laughs> thought of that until you mentioned that. Well, Schubert, oh, what can you say about Schubert? The, the great writer of songs was also a great symphonist, symphonist and chamber music composer. But um, during his lifetime, um, he was known for his songs and did not get a lot of, um, I was going to say airtime, did not get a lot of <laughs> performances of his chamber music or, or his, his symphonies that, that often. And the um, you know pieces that are famous now, string quartets like Death and the Maiden based on a song, one of his songs, and the Trout Quintet, which also has a movement with the theme and variations from one of his songs, and the, Schu the, octet, the Schubert octet also has a set of variations on one of his songs. So, so his um, life as a songwriter is always present, but the, uh, the octet, I don't think it received a public performance during his lifetime, and, and not until oh. years after his death was it was it published, and even the first time it was performed, it due to its length, perhaps it was only performed in a four movement version, um, much like a, um, a traditional symph symphonic work with with, a, with a, a sonata form, first movement, a slow movement, a scherzo or a minuet, and then a finale. Um, but this also had a scherzo and a minuet and and this beautiful set of variations that wouldn't really fit into the the uh, classical symphonic genre. So in a way, it's it, it's a symphony for eight players, but it's also a serenade, which is is more the form that that would be played in an evening's entertainment and and I could definitely see playing a couple of movements having a little conversation tell a few jokes <laughs> have a drink play a couple more movements it, and, and often it is played that way let's hey are you free on Thursday night let's just get together and play the Schubert octet <laughs> all night <laughs> it's a chamber music party kind of kind of a piece it, it also really does have symphonic proportions, and um, 
there's a really interesting recording that's now on uh, YouTube of a live performance of the Cleveland Orchestra with George Zell doing it as as a symphonic arrangement with um, with about uh, a dozen string players, maybe four on a part, with just the single winds. So uh, as a chamber orchestra uh, with Zell, I I think with mixed results, and I uh, was very impressed with it. And um, the playing is extraordinary, but I think it works quite well in its original instrumentation. Um, Schubert wrote the piece oh, about 20 years after Beethoven uh, had written his famous Septet, which was Beethoven's biggest success during his lifetime. He, he grew to hate his Septet because uh, he wanted people to listen to his late quartets and his late s symphonies and, and perhaps Fidelio and, and um, the septet was the piece that that everybody wanted to hear and it's 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 a very charming ebullient lovely multifaceted multi-movement work in the key of E flat and um, Schubert definitely had that in mind uh, when he wrote his octet, and he, he he put his octet up a step from E flat to oh F, gosh. added a player, <laughs> and uh, and really outdid it. Added about added uh, twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say about fifteen <laughs> minutes. Made a made a bigger work. Uh, although I don't know if he was really trying to upstage. Uh, uh, Beethoven or honor him, but but it was definitely influenced, and it all, this was also a time when the serenade was was integral to musical life. Um, works like that, multiple works, uh, some of the most famous, uh, for instance, are Mozart's Grand Partita, the the wind serenade with movement after movement after movement, um, dance form, sonata form. Uh, Arias, theme variation, and um, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, all contributed mightily to the, these evenings of entertainment in, in one work or several works of serenade form. So um, the sonority that, uh, that Schubert uh, drew on was definitely the, the sonority that, that Beethoven had had drawn on where he took the wind serenade and the si and the string serenade and 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 blended them together um, then took Luffler to add a harp to that but <laughs> <laughs> the the sonority of the clarinet bassoon and horn I is one that that I just have, have always loved it has the overtones and the way that the, the three instruments blend and create this entire sound world and it, it's it's used as as a both as a way to fill out the whole orchestral timbre of of the five strings and the three winds and also to have the choirs of the two instruments the, there are so many places in the piece where you'll hear a kind of a call and response where the strings for instance in the opening of the minuet the phrase will start from the from the strings, and then the winds play, and um, the interplay makes it more chamber music like, but the sonority of all the instruments together, um, more more symphonic. Okay, so I'm the only one on stage just playing in it tonight, but. Sure, you have some thoughts. Yeah, I love that last thought. I, that's my favorite thing about these large chamber music ensembles blending winds and strings. That it kind of hits this sweet spot between the decibels and the timbral spectrum of an orchestra, while maintaining the kind of nimbleness and the transparency and the intimacy of chamber music. So all, all three pieces on the program tonight are interesting examples of that. I must say that Coolidge Auditorium is, is just about the ideal place to hear 
works like this. It, it's just extraordinary that the, the, the sonority, just the right size, you know, doesn't sound like a little orchestra getting lost in a big hall, and it doesn't sound like a big orchestra o over overpowering a small room. It's just perfect proportion. Well, thank you so much for uh, that kind of overview. That I think that's that's a wonderful um, kind of introduction to the, the uh, Schubert, and I, I know everybody's going to enjoy it. I just want to throw in there to mention that the Library of Congress has the holographic manuscript of the Grand Partita um, here as well. This is a um, just throwing it out there as an aside that you can check it out. <laughs> yeah, it's worth it. Um, I wonder if we can take uh, just a couple minutes. If anybody, if there are questions in the audience, if you could just wait for. Um, a mic will come up to you. Mic will bring a mic. Thank you so much. Excuse me if I missed this before, but um, how did the library come to have the Leffler manuscript? Is that did he give it to the library? Is there? Do you have a Leffler collection? Do you want me to? Yeah. Um, Leffler had a number of ties to the Library of Congress. He. As we um, have touched on, Elizabeth Spray Coolidge was a close friend of his and um, an important supporter of his. She campaigned for concerts um, of his music in the US and in Europe. Uh, she commissioned him for the opening of Coolidge Auditorium and the beginning of this concert series. Um, also, the director of the music division during Leffler's lifetime was a man named Carl Engel. Um, and they were extremely close friends. They exchanged letters throughout their life. And um, so Leffler uh, bequeathed a, a number of his manuscripts to the library when he died. And then his widow, Elise Faye Leffler, um, passed on the remaining manuscripts when she died, uh, I think, the following year. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any idea how the original two performances uh, relate to what you've been able to reproduce or recreate? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, since I they were not recorded, of course, um, the piece had never been recorded until uh, until this album that, that is coming out in a couple of weeks. We can't know for sure, but there are a number of um, contemporary reviews from the premiere performance. For example, that's how I knew for sure that the harp cadenza is what was heard rather than the original version of that passage because the um, a reviewer for the Boston Evening Transcript was very struck by that moment and, and just by Leffler's handling of this instrumentation that we've been talking about in general and he he called that out in his review, um, talking about this dramatic harp cadenza. I think he compared it to a lighted match being set to a pile of gunpowder, the way the <laughs> harp kind of explodes out of the texture. <laughs> right? That's accurate. <laughs> so um, there's little clues like that. But of course, it's mostly kind of shrouded in these unknowns. Um, and uh, as I've said, uh, it's very possible that, that um, there's so many of these revisions um, kind of contorting the piece in different directions between the different sources. Uh, and given Leffler's kind of um, fastidious manner of composing and like endless impulse to revise, um, it, it was well within his habit to continue revising pieces after they had been performed, um, you know, and stash them away in a drawer rather than publishing them. So we have no idea how many of these revisions were completed before the performance or after. Um, there was a, a review that in the Boston Globe that commented on the appearance of the sheet music at the premiere. Um, that said something like the performers had to play from huge pieces of manuscript that almost covered the stage. <laughs> I, like, you never know with these 19th century journalists, that could just be the sort of typical hyperbole. Um, 
and and we were looking at the manuscript today. It is big, I will say, but it did not cover the stage. <laughs> um, it was it thoughtful for the pe for the performers. I thought like it was, uh, and there were, there were, you know many like paste overs. So it could be that maybe some of these revisions hadn't been glued in yet. They were maybe they were extending from the sides, um, but. Leffler had been composing for public performance for six years by the time of the Octet's premiere, and he himself was a very accomplished violinist. So there's there's no reason to believe that he was ill-equipped to pre prepare parts, standard issue parts for performance. So if there was something unusual about their appearance, um, that suggests to me that uh, he kind of ran out of time to clean them up for the performance. So. Probably he was editing right up until the downbeat, um, and maybe after. It's hard to know exactly, you know, what was heard, but um, I think the piece was pretty much in a s in a state of flux. And that never happens to any other composers, <laughs> by the way. That's not not like a standard thing, but um, that's wonderful. Do we? I think we could do one more. Or we'll do two more. Yeah, let's, we'll do one over here. Yes, yes, thank you. I had a question about uh, taking an orchestral work and making it into a chamber work and a little bit about that process, about how you go through that and pick out what do you want, what do you want, what do you put in? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I've written a number of arrangements and some of them are contractions like that, taking a, a large score and distilling it for smaller forces and then other times i've gone the other way taking like a piece for solo piano and expanding it to say a quintet and i found that the process is very different um and both involve a lot of creativity but going in different directions so like taking a piano piece and expanding it <coughs> i was trying to imagine what new colors i could kind of bring to this to to sort of enliven the work in a new way. Whereas taking Debussy's already so colorful um, kind of kaleidoscopic score, I was thinking of how, what are other ways I can capture these colors that are already there without losing some of, some of this amazing variety. Um, I started sort of with the ensemble because um, as I said, it was inspired by the Ravel introduction Allegro. So I think this kind of, there's already so much color built into this sound world, this mixed timbre ensemble of winds, strings, and harp. And it, it kind of has these impressionist resonances um, that works very naturally with Ravel's music. So I thought it, it would also suit the Debussy. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's do one more question. Uh, thanks. I hope you don't mind a non-Leffler question, but since it's a chance to ask Mr. Schiffer a question, I just remembered a wonderful concert um, you were in at the National Gallery of Art, and it was um, with Curtis musicians, and it was, I think, a tribute to Leonard Bernstein. Yeah, yeah. And I just wondered if you had any singular memorable event, if you interactions with Mr. Bernstein, especially in, t in terms of Maestro being so popular you know, as a movie. I never worked with M Mr. Bernstein. That was a question. I, I, I was present um, at many of his concerts as in the audience. I was president, I was present <laughs> at, at some rehearsals uh, with the Cleveland Orchestra, but I wasn't playing in it at the time. And um, just um, I think he was uh, such such an important um, gift to to music to all of us. And yeah, I saw the movie too. I thought that <laughs> I thought Brad Cooper did an incredible impersonation. Well, let me uh, please join me in thanking the musicians for.